the role of imams in building bridges between Muslims and other diverse communities in New Zealand. A conference report. According to the census figures of 2006, there were about 37,000 Muslims resident in New Zealand from various ethnic backgrounds, including about 3,000 New Zealand Europeans and Maori. These Muslims belong to different Islamic associations and trusts that are organised under seven regional organisations spread around the North and South Islands of New Zealand. These seven regional organisations and their associated trusts form the Federation of Islamic Associations of New Zealand, or FIANS. On top of FIANS's structure is the Board of Scholars, the Alama Board, made up of imams of the mosques associated with FIANS. The first conference of the New Zealand Imams was held in Auckland on the 27th and 28th of October of 2007 under the auspices of FIANS and the New Zealand Ministry of Ethnic Affairs. One aim of the conference was to bring together the Imams and leaders of the New Zealand Muslim community to dialogue with government representatives and other non-governmental organisations for the purpose of affirming the rights and the responsibilities of New Zealand Muslims at large and their Imams and leaders in particular in fostering a harmonious coexistence and bridge building with the wider diverse communities in New Zealand. Another aim of the conference was to provide the New Zealand Muslim leadership with the knowledge of the government services available so that they can assure their communities utilise them when needed. The Prime Minister of New Zealand, Helen Clark, some of her ministers including the Minister of Ethnic Affairs, Chris Carter, and her parliamentary colleague, Dr Ashraf Chowdhury, and the New Zealand imams and officials of many government departments participated in the conference. The conference was inaugurated by the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Helen Clark. And I should declare the conference officially open. Thank you. <laughs> Prime Minister, we have uh, this uh, Holy Quran in English. It's titled The Meaning of the Holy Quran. And uh, uh, we know we don't have real faith as such, but uh, we hope it will make a good reading. And may Allah give you that. Good morning, everybody. Federation of Islamic Associations of New Zealand, Imams, and everyone who has come today. And it's a, a broad gathering today because uh, the government is very supportive of this initiative by FIANS to bring uh, the conference together. 
and accordingly Office of Ethnic Affairs has been uh, helpful. The Prime Minister Helen Clark in her speech acknowledged the diverse nature of the Muslim community in New Zealand, joined together by a common belief in one God. She said that religious institutions face common issues today around the position of women within societies and in leadership roles, the position of diaspora communities who are minorities, the position of faith communities in a post 9-11 world and in a context where there perhaps hasn't been widespread societal knowledge or understanding of the world's religions and countries. And the unity of faith communities that are made up of multicultural members worldwide. She said in New Zealand there are issues for Muslims fitting into wider society and told the Muslim leaders, including the Imams, that they have a critical role to play in assisting Muslims, both young and old, to negotiate their way in such a context as both Muslims and Kiwis, and in directing their community members to be productive and engaged members of society. That we should treat every person for their potential ability uh, contribution. And we acknowledge their faith, but we acknowledge it also as a positive, positive thing, because uh, a faith can also give people a place to stand, uh, a creed to believe in, it can be a very, very positive thing as well. You're going to have presentations today from uh, a range of uh, officials uh, from our police, our justice ministry, our child, youth and family service, a part of the Ministry of Social uh, Development and uh, also the Office of Ethnic Affairs. So that suggests good government support for the what Māori would call the kōpapa here today, the general purpose of the, of the meeting. And I know that the uh, concept of this was developed a little bit in a meeting I had with Fians uh, probably around a year ago, I think, uh, Javed, where you were interested in doing this. And uh, we said, what a great idea, bring everybody together. And let, let's talk about, uh, as you've said, uh, being Kiwi Muslims in a country which has a Muslim minority, about 36,000, which is now quite a substantial minority, but a minority nonetheless, less than 1% uh, of, the, of, of the population. And I do think it's a tremendous uh, commitment of the faith you all have that you've come from all corners of New Zealand today to be part of this meeting right on the edge of my electorate. I'm so happy it's close to home. <laughs> so I can welcome you as tongue and a feather almost here. Uh, and I know there's been so much work going on behind the scenes to make the meeting uh, possible. I come uh, to meetings of the uh, Islamic communities and I'm always impressed by how they're like the United Nations because you come from all corners of the globe. A very small minority of Kiwi Muslims are actually Kiwi Europeans. A lot of Kiwi Muslims are from Fiji, others from the Middle East, Southeast Asia, Africa, United Kingdom, you name it. People from right around the globe. So you are truly a United Nations of a faith. And we acknowledge that as well because it shows how people across culture can unite in a faith, can work together. And I think that's a very positive message uh, from Islam, as it's a positive message from other great religions. Take Christianity, its people are also found around the globe, across culture. So that's the strength of a good faith, that the power of ideas brings people together. And that has to be a force for uh, good, in, in my view. Now, to ensure that all our communities in New Zealand are treated equally, are included, people have the quality of opportunity. Uh, it was thought it would be a good idea to convene this meeting of faith leaders, of imams, so that as leaders of your communities, you are also very well connected with the services available for communities, irrespective of faith, culture, or heritage in New Zealand, and that when members of your community approach you and say, look, I've got a problem, you know where to send them. You know what advice might be appropriate for them. And I think that's something leaders across all our communities need to know. They need to know how to refer people on, what to suggest, uh, and so on. Prime Minister Helen Clark mentioned a number of programs and policy initiatives her government has embarked upon to respond to the issues around Muslims and the wider community in New Zealand. 
This includes the Connecting Diverse Communities project, which includes over 70 initiatives led by various government agencies. She concluded her speech by encouraging all the conference attendees to participate in interfaith work around New Zealand in mutual respect and tolerance, and said her government is setting an example that respect for diversity and learning about each other's cultures and traditions is essential to a cohesive society, a society which is also stronger and richer through cultural exchange. Prime Minister, your thoughts on the first Olomas conference in New Zealand? I'm thrilled the conference is happening. I'm thrilled that the Federation of Islamic Associations of New Zealand has brought everybody together. And it's a terrific chance for the government and its officials to be talking with these community leaders about the many services that are available for people in New Zealand. Often people will go to the imam as they would to a priest or a minister uh, for some advice. And if our imams are well informed about the range of things that are available, then they can be very helpful. Any specific goals the government has uh, set in this regard? Our goal is to run an inclusive society. For an inclusive society, you need people as full participating citizens, aware of their rights, aware of what the services are, aware of the opportunities in New Zealand. So today is about discussing those things. I think that during the eight years I've been Prime Minister of a Labour-led government, it has been a real flowering of the ethnic communities in New Zealand. I think for the first time they've really felt valued and included, and that's the way it's going to be under the government that I lead. And I very much valued the overwhelming support we've had from the many ethnic minority communities and faith minority communities of New Zealand. Member of Parliament Dr Chowdhury in his speech challenged the Imams to find solutions to some of the issues facing the New Zealand Muslim community, using their local knowledge rather than relying on religious edicts or fatwas from overseas scholars. He said issues such as the proposed use of pancreas tissue cells from pigs to treat diabetes should be resolved by our Imams using the knowledge available to them. For us to understand how to live in a, in a non-Muslim environment, and particularly when it comes to the leaders of the prayers and preachers and our, our leaders anywhere in life, uh, particularly uh, who are teaching our children, people who are you know, imams, it's very important for us to understand that we are living in a very different environment from where we came from. Most of us come from Muslim countries, if you like, a Muslim majority country. Here we are we're living in a minority country, so there are a lot of other obligations upon us and we need to understand how to live in these environments and I think this is the beginning of another phase to me, another phase for Pians particularly because we have been going through this process of consolidation over the years and now it's time that we need to take more leadership in terms of understanding where we're living. And I was really stuck uh, the other day, I was very impressed with one of our preachers, and I'm going to quote this word here today, uh, and that's, he said in, in Urdu language, and he said, Jahan Dawa, Wahan Dili. And I was very impressed by that. What it means is, Prime Minister, that where an issue has been raised, or where a concern is raised, we have to find solutions there. We have to find local solutions. And that's what's fantastic. You have always, you have always taken a keen interest in our community, in particular, and for which we are most appreciative. Javed Khan, the president of Fians, emphasized the teachings of Islam on coexistence and extolled the Muslim community in New Zealand not to stand apart from the wider New Zealand society. He said that religious harmony in a multiracial society such as in New Zealand is crucial for peaceful coexistence among the various communities and that everyone has a stake and a part to play in observing and promoting racial and religious respect and accord. He urged the Muslim community and particularly the Imams, Ozdad religious teachers, teachers and the mosque leadership in New Zealand to take in new ideas, seek out better methods and build capabilities that benefit the Muslim community and New Zealand as a whole. Mr Khan suggested that mosques should be rejuvenated and the Imams to extend their roles beyond the traditional ones they currently play of leading prayers and performing religious ceremonies to incorporate counselling and other services.
He mentioned a number of initiatives that Fianz is planning in order to improve the Muslim community in general and their imams, including capacity building, promoting thoughtful and enlightened discourse on Islam and creating a New Zealand Muslim identity. Javed concluded his speech by reiterating that our aim of developing a community that is religiously profound and socially progressive, that thrives in a multi-religious society, secular state and globalized world, can be realized only if all of us work together. I believe there could be three possible ways in which Fians and our religious leaders could undertake to maximize our positive achievements. Firstly, Fians would look into providing the leadership in facilitating our religious community to develop their knowledge and expertise to work in interdisciplinary teams and to address multifaceted issues. They could be guided to move beyond the apparent divide of the sacred and profane, of the spiritual and physical, towards a framework that comes up with practical, coherent solutions that enhances the community's well-being. Perhaps, in collaboration with the government, Fianz would seriously <coughs> endeavor to organize workshops and seminars to further enhance and broaden the talents of our religious community through to facilitating study attachments at renowned religious institutions around the world so that we are able to take holistic approach to developing religious leaders. Secondly, Fianz would endeavor to shape a more thoughtful and enlightened discourse on Islam and policy research on religious, religious issues. There are several issues which require study and research. Under the overarching theme of Islam and modern world, issues such as the identity of Muslims in a secularized state is certainly a pertinent one. Another is the issue of globalization of religion and its influence and effect on local communities. Fianz would find a way to facilitate the discourse to these issue, issues as we embrace a greater religious, religiously diverse and culturally complex society. Thirdly, given the limited resources of the Muslim community, Fianz could provide the opportunity to consolidate existing capabilities through partnerships and collaborations with other Muslim local and regional associ associations that provide training and education to the religious community. By doing so, capacity building within the community can be more focused, take on a faster pace and yield greater results. The message I like to put forward is that we need to forge a New Zealand Muslim identity. As the national Muslim organization, Fianz would work with the religious community to articulate the attributes of the New Zealand Muslim community. It is hoped that this document will act like a compass for the community by articulating the New Zealand Muslim community's aspirations and practice of religious life, which is progressive, inclusive, and contextualized to New Zealand's multiracial and multi-religious society. According to the tradition of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, a true believer is one, from, is one with whom others feel secure, one who returns love for hatred. The chairman of the Fian's Ulama board, Sheikh Amir, reiterated the peaceful nature of Islam and condemned any action by any individual, Muslim or not, that goes against the values and the teachings of Islam, which guarantees peace as a right for all. Sheikh Amir also condemned all extreme acts perpetrated in the name of religion and decried those who associate extreme acts perpetrated by Muslims with Islam and called upon them to judge Islam by what it teaches and not by the actions of some of its followers. That the purpose behind the creation of different tribes and a various nation is to interact and know each other better. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal nasu inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa unta al-ayah, which means, O oh mankind, we created you from a single pair of male and female and made you 
into the nations and the tribes that you may know each other. Also, Islam never limited peace and harmony to those who accepted the faith. On the contrary, by establishing the principle of la ikraha fi din, no compulsion in religion, that was stated clearly in the Quran, Islam made peace a right for everyone, whether affiliated with the religion of Islam or not. This, this, this challenge really that the Prime Minister gave us this morning, which was about learning to live together, but also in telling our stories. And telling our stories gives us a place in the, in, in the, in the book that's called New Zealand. The New Zealand Minister of Ethnic Affairs, Chris Carter, presented the first paper of the conference, following the inaugural speech by the Prime Minister. In his paper, he reaffirmed his government's message that in New Zealand, all faith, ethnic and cultural groups are worthy of equal respect. He elaborated on the various government initiatives earlier mentioned by the Prime Minister in her speech. Curiosity that, that New it, it is a strongly New Zealand characteristic in our culture to be curious about people. I guess it's part of the product of living far at the end of the world and being a, a country of, of immigrants. New Zealand, remember, is, is the last large land mass in the world to be settled by people. So everyone here is a relatively, even our, our indigenous people uh, who have been here about 800 years. Uh, that's in the, in the total history of a, of a country, say, like Iraq or, or Pakistan, which may have had people living in it for uh, 100,000 years, as long as people have existed. Uh, he reminded the conference that, participants that compromise is needed to enable members to live together in a community. He made it categorically clear that it is not the role or the responsibility of government to prescribe the qualifications for imams, create a board of imams, conduct training for religious leaders, or resolve disputes within the religious communities. He said all these matters are for the imams and the Muslim leaders to resolve. The role of the government is only to assist and provide support. The minister acknowledged the daunting tasks facing our imams and the opportunities their position in the community offers, including, one, the chance to demonstrate that the true expression of Islam is not in conflict with a Western way of life. Two, to help maintain and build New Zealand's reputation as a peaceful and inclusive nation. And three, to instill a confidence in New Zealand Muslims that they can be equal and committed members of New Zealand society while being true to their faith. He concluded his speech by citing a well-known Arab proverb which says, one hand alone cannot clap, to underscore the need for the imams and the government to create ways of working together, building bridges between communities in New Zealand. The role of Islam Awareness Week in this regard was acknowledged by Chris Carter, as did the Prime Minister in her speech. When uh, Sheikh uh, Mohammed Amir spoke, he talked about the importance of explaining the fundamentals of Islam and, and getting that story across to all New Zealanders. Prime Minister touched on the importance of uh, Islam Awareness Week, and I really want to thank all of the uh, uh, imams and uh, teachers who are here who work to open the mosques up to the local community. Various government agencies presented papers, including one by Mervyn Singham, the Director of the Office of Ethnic Affairs, on the diversity of New Zealand society. On Law and Order by Area Commander Jim Wilson. Human Rights by Stuart Bursford of the Ministry of Justice. One on security by Ambassador Del Higgy of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Child, Youth and Family by Judy Clayton and Rashida of the Department of Child, Youth and Family. And one on border control, immigration and customs by Api Fiso of the Department of Labor and Eddie Karl Hasse of the Customs Department. The common thread in all the presentations by the various government agencies was the emphasis on the rights of all New Zealanders, including Muslims, for equal treatment and opportunities in all matters under the agency's various jurisdictions. Their presentations complemented what was earlier mentioned on the issues during the Prime Minister's and the Ethnic Minister's speeches. 
Conference participants, including the imams, learned of their rights and responsibilities directly from the relevant agencies and were given ample opportunities to ask questions and engage in dialogue with the speakers who provided adequate responses to the issues raised during the question and answer sessions. Some of the issues discussed include the increased effort on the part of the police to deal with the problem of youth joining gangs and creating havoc, particularly in the Auckland area. The initiatives being taken by the New Zealand government to comply with United Nations resolutions, not only in the areas of hard threats, such as terrorism prevention, but also in reducing soft threats, such as hunger and poverty. The checks and balances in place to protect the human rights of individuals in New Zealand within the Terrorism Act. The treatment of Muslims by the authorities at points of entry, such as airports, and the relationships between the immigration, customs, MAF and other agencies at the border. All the speakers assured the Muslims that they will look into some of the issues raised by the participants with a view to improving their services and relationships with those they serve. I believe that interfaith is an important and valuable tool in moulding and shaping one of the most significant aspects of this community and that is the way in which we interact and live together with others. Sister Rehana Ali spoke on an interfaith approach to the participation of New Zealand Muslims. She used the abbreviation INFIDEL, which stands for Islamophobia, News, Foreign, Inequality, Damned, Enemy and Losers, to describe the situation of Muslims post 9-11. She told the participants that there are many ways Muslims can dialogue with others and that one of the surest ways is for them to strengthen their faith and structures and practice the values the religion taught them, which will speak for itself. She suggested empowering the Muslim scholars as was done in the past by setting grants for them, if these goals were to be achieved. Extremism and moderation in Islam because it gives the impression as if both are equally legitimate in Islam, which is not the case. Dr. Najibola Lafrai of Otago University spoke on extremism and moderation in Islam. He argued that Islam is a religion of moderation and that extremism emanates from ignorance and narrow-mindedness. He said all good Muslims are fundamentalists, but they cannot be described as extremist. He agreed with Sister Rehana that opportunities should be given for Muslim scholars who teach the Islamic values of moderation to be heard in order to avoid the religion being hijacked by extremist elements within it. And I think it's important to note that, yes, there have been extremist Muslims from the very beginning, but they have always been at the fringe. No, no way, no time, mainstream of Islam. Main of the stream of Islam has always been what is called moderate. Why? Because that is the teaching of Islam. All that is happening around, the youth are under more tremendous pressure than anyone else. If you are traveling today at my own age, it is very likely that I will be overlooked. Oh, this guy is an orphan, he will not do anything. But if you are a young, and particularly maybe an Arab, you know, youth traveling, you will be put under tremendous scrutiny, you know, around the world with a lot of suspicion. So our youth are definitely under a lot of stress. Again, if we look at, you know, the issue of the Muslims living in the West, the issues that the youth are facing living in the West, in diaspora, is completely different from the issues that they are facing back home. So that's why it's important that, you know, we talk about it. And in the context of what is happening since 9-11 also, the youth, the riot in France, the bombings, you know, that took place in Britain, the 9-11 itself, everything involves youth. And therefore, there's a lot of focus on youth. Dr. Mustafa Farouk spoke on youth. He provided the general characteristics of youth, and in particular the Muslim youth in majority Muslim countries and in the diaspora. He highlighted the issues facing Muslim youth and discussed the role the family, mosques and imams can play in creating a model New Zealand Muslim youth. He said that the mosque and imams can supplement or even act as a surrogate parent for Muslim youth. 
Imams can help towards this goal by teaching and delivering khutbahs or sermons that are meaningful and relevant to the life of the youth, integrative, spiritually, emotionally, socially, intellectually and physically, and values-based. He added that Imams must develop positive youth development and initiative through voluntary structural activities to be able to shape youth and to reduce their involvement in risky behaviours and extreme acts. He suggested that Imams should adopt the model and approach the Muslims took when they were living as minorities in Ethiopia and China in the early days of Islam, that won them the admiration and respect of their hosts, and to apply in New Zealand today to teach the youth the importance of building bridges and peaceful coexistence with the wider society. With all these things that are happening since 9-11, the pressure is more on our boys than, than the girls. Although the girls are the ones who have to go out in hijab, they don't disappear. Alhamdulillah, maybe that toughens them up more. We don't know. We cannot apply that directly to New Zealand because this study is not done here. But maybe this also applies here. We need to start looking at these issues here and see what we can do you know, for our own youth. Our practices revolve around the teaching of the book, the Quran, and our human model, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In New Zealand, we can be grouped further according to the context of our life here. And I would suggest that perceptually this is far more, a far more relevant grouping for us than classifications of ethnicity. Sister Aisha Wood Bulanor spoke on women in Islam. She categorised Muslim women in New Zealand in groups each with their own characteristics and needs. She identified the lack of access to mosques and other facilities available for men as one of the biggest problems facing Muslim women in New Zealand. She urged the Imams and Muslim leaders to provide women with facilities so that they can educate themselves in the religion and empower themselves to be better contributors in the community. The Imams among the participants had a session in which they discussed issues around sermons, khutbah and women in the mosque. They acknowledged that in New Zealand it is relevant for sermons to be addressed in English in order for the majority of the congregation to understand the message being presented. They highlighted the relevance of giving the right message on Friday sermons and agreed that it is one of the most important mediums of reaching out to the majority of Muslims and passing on the message of peaceful coexistence in Islam. Allahu Akbar. The Imams called upon Fians to facilitate occasions for them to socialize with each other and to strengthen their relationships in order to increase the unity among Muslims whom they lead. At the end of the conference, the participants, including the Imams, resolved the following. One, that the conference succeeded in achieving its main goals of bringing the Imams and the Muslim leaders together with relevant New Zealand government agencies to dialogue and to improve the understanding of each other's responsibilities. Two, to endorse the various government initiatives towards building a more inclusive and tolerant society discussed by the Prime Minister and the Ethnic Affairs Minister during their speeches and those elaborated on by officials of the government agencies that spoke at the conference. Three, the Imams and community leaders will work hard to continue promoting the spirit of peaceful coexistence with the wider community in New Zealand. Four, 
The Imams will endeavour to deliver their sermons in both Arabic and English to improve their effectiveness in teaching Islamic values to their congregation and in passing the message of building bridges with the wider community. 5. To improve the access of women to the mosque and facilities within what the religion allows in terms of separation of the sexes. 6. For the Imams to extend their roles beyond their current traditional role and to work closer with youth to prevent youth from getting involved in risky behaviours and extreme acts. 7. To publish a book detailing the success and failures of New Zealand Muslim parents in raising a model New Zealand youth for new Muslim immigrants to learn from. 8. To organise more workshops and hui's in the future in order to continue the dialogues with stakeholders and to build capacities to serve the community and New Zealand better. 9. To provide facilities for imams to get trained in counselling in order to improve their role in the community. 10. To improve the communication between imams in order to improve dialogue within the Muslim community. And 11. To welcome wholeheartedly the government message delivered through the Minister of Ethnic Affairs that the New Zealand government is ready to assist New Zealand Muslims in building stronger relationships with other communities and allowing the leadership of New Zealand Muslims to run their religious affairs without interference from the government. <laughs> Thank you.